afternoon and welcome to the first of a two-part series of Impact 2021, Indigenous Voice Engaging Our Community in the Co-Design Process. Before we begin, I too would like to acknowledge elders on the lands and the waters and the rivers and the beautiful trees and all of the amazing country that we're sitting on around our country of Australia. I'd like us all to please reflect on whose country you're on today, on where you're growing, you're learning, you're working, you're living as people. I'm incredibly proud to today be sitting and living on Bunurong country, which is on the waters, the beautiful, beautiful ocean in Victoria. I am from the Wiradjuri Nation, from New South Wales, very central New South Wales, where the country turns red. And I'd like to acknowledge my elders who without their guidance and their love and support, I would not be able to be here today. So I hope as we go on throughout our discussion today, our very, very important discussion, we think about that and we reflect on who has guided us to be able to be here, to be able to talk or listen and learn and take that with us on our journey forward from this point. So, Firstly, I'd like to introduce our very, very esteemed panel. And it is incredibly, my incredible honour to be able to be here and to be able to moderate this panel today. Dr. Donna Odegaard, AM, the Honourable Jeff Kennett, AC, and the incomparable uh, Dr. Emily. Uh, before we begin our discussion, though, I think it's really important that we reflect a little bit on the process that brought us here. In October 2019, the Minister for, Indi for Indigenous Australians announced a co-design process for Indigenous Voice. This discussion, this process is what we're going to be talking about today. But before we begin that, let's watch a little video that brought us here and allows us to understand the coming together of this process. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people would choose the members of the National Voice. All states and the Northern Territory would be represented by two National Voice members. The ACT would be represented by one or two members. The Torres Strait Islands would also be represented by one or two members. There would be instances where the members from the Torres Strait Islands represent the views of all Torres Strait Islanders, including those living on the mainland. This would occur for matters of national significance to Torres Strait Islanders. There are two ways members could be chosen. Model 1 is by choosing members from local and regional voices. Model 2 is by choosing members through an election process. Under both models, there would be gender balance among members. Under both models, there is also an option for a state or territory representative body for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to select national voice members, if one exists. The national voice could have up to 20 members. This could include two appointed members to fill gaps where needed, but only where the national voice members and minister agree. For example, Appointees could be used to ensure a mix of urban, regional, and remote members. Membership would be open to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. There could be an ethics council to provide advice to the National Voice on governance matters and ongoing integrity. 50% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are under 25 years of age and 25% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live with a disability. Permanent youth and disability advisory groups would ensure those perspectives are captured by the national voice. The proposed national voice would be an advisory body to both the Australian Parliament and the Australian Government. It could provide advice on national matters it decides are the most important to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. These matters would be prioritised by the national voice. They would be on nationally significant matters of critical importance to the social, spiritual and economic well-being of 
or which has a significant or particular impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The national voice could be engaged from the early stages of the development of relevant laws and policies. It could provide both formal and informal advice. Parliament and the government would be required to ask the national voice for advice on laws and policies which only impact Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. They would be expected to ask the national voice for advice on laws and policies that have a big impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. When a law is introduced to Parliament, it would be made clear if the national voice has been asked for advice, if advice was provided and what the advice is. The national voice would add to what exists already. This means it would work with and talk to existing structures, not replace them. The national voice would also connect with local and regional voices, ensuring it reaches into local communities. This would be a two-way relationship. The national voice would seek community input through local and regional voices. These elements support the role of the national voice to have the right and responsibility on behalf of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians to advise Parliament and the Government on national issues that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Thank you so much for playing that. And if you had any trouble with the audio or you'd like to watch that again, the link will be available in your chat. So this process, as I said, began in 2019. Three co-design groups were created to determine proposals for Indigenous and voice, for an Indigenous voice for government to consider. Throughout 2020, during, the state, during stage one of this process, members of the three groups developed proposals for an Indigenous voice with two complementary parts, local and regional voices and a national voice. Today, we're going to be looking at this and we're going to be talking to members of our national group. Hopefully I got that much. Um, I'd really, really love to be able to start with Dr Odegaard. As the co-chair, um, it really fascinates me as to why you joined our Indigenous Voice and what you think this brings to Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Australia. Uh, thanks for that, Sadie. And um, uh, it was something that I couldn't, I felt I couldn't say no to because the work I've done over the past 30 or so years, uh, it had always throughout that was themed this, we call for our voices to be heard. And that, that really, uh, to me, uh, was, uh, you know, why I didn't want to refuse and I felt quite honoured to be invited. Um, but, uh, look, I'm just going to backtrack a bit here um, because I'm, uh, I, I need to acknowledge country where I am at the moment, so I apologise for that. So I, I'm in... Uh, uh, I'm on the land of the Gimoy, uh, Walbra and uh, Yurigandji country, which uh, is in far north Queensland in Cairns. So I, I would just like to uh, pay my respects and acknowledgement to our traditional owners, custodians and our elders past and present, and also acknowledge my, um, uh, my group, National Indigenous Co-Design Group members, uh, the Honourable Jeff Kennett and also Dr. Emma Lee. Now, uh, just going back to that very important question, uh, and, and I think this has been captured by other uh, members and, and others outside, uh, we've been calling for our voices to, to be heard. Uh, it speaks to what I stand for as a Larrakia traditional owner and the uh, work that I've done for decades. So in short, um, that's the reason. It's a great opportunity um, uh, and, and I want to be part of this whole process for a national voice. Dr Lee, I would ask you the same question. I know as um, an actual woman from um, Tasmania, your work has been incredibly influential in um, creating these spaces. And why did you join the Indigenous Voice? Mm. Uh, thank you, dear. Uh, Dr. Sadie, and uh, hello everyone. I'm coming to you from Plain Minkahilaplu country in uh, Tasmania. 
I live in Tominginan country just across the river and I come from Tebrakunan country which is on the northeast of Tasmania. Um, I'm so excited to see you all here um, how everyone and in particular you Frank Exxon <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the messages to people talking about that they know the country that they come from. And this beautiful and joyous celebration of not only an Indigenous heritage but an Australian heritage is the thing that I want to be able to take to Parliament the joy in our relationships between Indigenous and other Australians. I want to be able to speak to the the love and the kinship and the reciprocity that we have with so many other Australians to help us get our rights. And so for me, one of the most important factors is that um, uh, Professor Emeritus John Altman and uh, I think it's Professor um, uh, Markham, uh, their research has shown that Indigenous peoples own, manage, or um, uh, partially, you know, engage with 50% of our continental landmass. We own or manage half our lands. And, and so we are not a silent investor in our nation. How can we be? We care for country. We want to be able to welcome everyone to country. And, and having worked in Tasmania to make some shifts over uh, the relationship that we have with government, what, what I found out is that those relationships are so incredibly important. We, we're so tied up in the art of governing, but sometimes we forget while we're actually doing it. Who, who is this that we're doing it for? And I have no problem in making the statement that other people who have made decisions for us with the best of intentions, it hasn't worked. We need to have our own say. We need to be able to express that joy, that relationship, reciprocity, not only as Indigenous peoples with each other, but as Indigenous and other peoples together, we've walked that bridge 20-odd years ago. We've connected with each other in terms of our rights. I want to be able to take to Parliament this beautiful community moment of people of Australia working together for our future generations. And out of all of this, you know, so much has passed me by. And this is why I wanted to get involved. I mean, I started out, you know, I mean, I'm Tasmanian Aboriginal up until 2016. We got constitutional recognition. I did not even exist. And so it is so important that we nest and scaffold our future generations with a respect, Indigenous generations with a respect that they know what's good for them but more so for the fact that Indigenous and others, as we get more truth-telling, as we have treaty, as we are more engaged in land management together, it's quite interesting because I, I believe in another generation, this discussion that we've had, people are going to turn around and go, what was that? Why, didn't they, why weren't they just allowed to give their opinion? And so for me, it's about acknowledging the efforts of so many other Australians to help get us here, but more so it is our voice in that cultural leadership at every level that we require in government from federal parliament to local um, government council areas. And so the voice works as this beautiful top down to meet the bottom up approach so that we know we have formal and legitimate advice. We know that it's not the internet keyboard warriors that are promoting something that's not quite right for all of us in our communities. 
And so we have seen a situation in the US where the fact that the advice hasn't been clear has led to tensions in the democratic system. And so if we are able to come to a system that says, yes, these people have been democratically engaged, voted in, and we can trust their opinions. And I think that says so much for the Australian public to have faith in all systems, particularly a democratic system that hasn't well served Indigenous peoples in the past. Thank you for so much for that. And I think it really speaks to the personal nature. It's not just, uh, you know, a ministerial appointment. It's something that is very personal and something that is part of your journey. Um, Mr. Kennett, I would ask the same question, but I may expand on that if you'll indulge me. So as somebody that knows very well um, our, our governments and our political system, do you see, what do you see as Indigenous voice and do you see it as a government process or more of a community one? All right, well, thank you, Sadie, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, sitting on a chair in the Wurundjeri uh, people's land here in Melbourne, and I respect their leaders past, present and future. This is an interesting process. My own education started in the early 80s when I was appointed minister responsible for Aboriginal affairs here in Victoria. And more recently, in the last few years, I've been head of an organisation called The Torch here in Victoria, which works with incarcerated Indigenous men and women, and then has a post-release program for them to try and ensure when they return to the community, they do not recommit a crime. And the recidivation rates are around 60%, but through the work of the torch, those who are part of the program, we've got that rate down to 11%. Uh, and I think the thing that upsets me most of all, and I even heard it this morning on the wireless, most of the discussion about the Indigenous community is about the failings, sadly. Not about a balance, not to say, only the good should be reported and commented on, but we've got to get the balance right. And so there is a great deal of misunderstanding. To give you an idea, many of the people we deal with at the torch who are incarcerated have little awareness of their own cultural background, where they've come from, their family, their lands. And we spend a lot of time trying to bring them together into a position of better understanding. The most important thing I think with the voice is A, that it recognises, regardless of the past, our Indigenous community are very special. They are an extraordinary asset. And we've got to make sure that we both respect past, present and future, but that we also give them the opportunity to educate those who are making decisions about their life and their welfare. And I don't know whether this is red rag or bull, but in more recent times, I think a lot of politicians, regardless of their politics, have done what they thought was the right thing, but in retrospect has not necessarily been the right thing because they haven't understood and because they haven't consulted as well as they should with those who are one individual living in two worlds. And so the voice gives us the opportunity to correct so much of the misunderstandings. And even with the voice and what has been happening today, there are people out there who are making comments that are factually incorrect. So the video that we were all able to witness a few moments ago is a very simple explanation that the voice is not something that's going to be in the constitution or in the preamble of the constitution. It is an advice group, but it is an advice group that can both raise matters back to the parliament and then accept potential legislation and regulations to review. And I think that is a natural step towards a better understanding between both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. 
and saying if I can just, so I think the opportunities are very real. And I just hope the whole concept of the voice does not get sidetracked. And I just finished on this note that we've seen in recent times that the Australian community are a lot more generous and educated that we often give them credit for. So for instance, the same sex marriage uh, referendum, many would have thought that people in rural Australia would have voted overwhelmingly against such legislation. But when it came to individuals making a decision, they voted overwhelmingly in favour of it. So there is this underlying intelligence within our communities. Forget all the rhetoric, forget all the way in which we're tr trying to be driven to conclusions by the media and those who loud, uh, shout loudest. The silent majority spoke in the most generous way possible. The introduction of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which recognises really for the first time those with disabilities and their carers, I think will go down in history as perhaps the most profound piece of social legislation this century. So therefore, I think what those who are on the torch are trying to do, and there's only a few of us who are not Indigenous by birth, uh, and it is driven, therefore, by the Indigenous community, I think we should take heart from the two examples I've given, that what we're on about in trying to seek Indigenous recognition in a mature and responsible way is without a doubt the right way to go. And therefore, these webinars, the discussions we have publicly are all designed to educate the broad community about the value of our first peoples and trying to get a balance into the discussion. But in trying to get the balance into the discussion, we also, also want to try and address some of the issues that are causing so much harm. And in particular, I'm talking about mm -hmm. uh, suicides among our young community, uh, Indigenous people, I'm talking about a difficulty with the law, etc. So there's a lot of challenges there, but I think the voice could be instrumental in trying to educate politicians about the indigenous culture when they're thinking about passing non-indigenous legislation. And, and I think that's incredibly important, isn't it? And, and as you say, it's not only educating our politicians, but it's also educating our public. Um, and as we educate, we might change and we change environments, we change minds, which means that then we have the opportunity to change the outcomes of our young ones that, you know, may be suffering mentally or may be suffering in other ways. We're actually changing those environments and that's incredibly, incredibly important. Now, you mentioned um, the video that we watched before, and, and I think that that's a really important thing when we're reflecting on this conversation is that video and how this national co-design process has been um, uh, brought together and, and created. Um, Dr Odegaard, do you see a diff what do you see as the difference between that national voice that Mr. Kennett was talking about, that ability to inform um, our politicians and our government and our processes and our policies, and that local and regional voice that might be changing things more locally and on the ground? Uh, well, Sadie, look, I, I, I just need to just talk about uh, pretty much the approach at the outset. And I'm, I'm referring to our, uh, our national uh, uh, co-design group. Um, we identified things at the very outset that we needed to be ourselves uh, not only comfortable with, but inclusive. Everyone at, within our group needed to have a voice and a say on, uh, first of all, what their understandings were. We underpinned our, our meetings, every meeting with cultural protocols and ethics, in other words, no matter whether you're First Nations, Indigenous people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, whether you're cultural authorities, whether you're non-Indigenous. And I really um, uh, am like to 
keep saying non-Indigenous, but because we came together as a group uh, with uh, this multiplicity of uh, experiences, backgrounds, uh, you name it, and we were able to uh, conduct our meetings within a narrative that would, would, would be able to be understood by, um, by our families, our communities, our legislators, and, and that being very cognizant of the fact that, um, pre, that laws and policies are just so um, uh, historically have been at odds and a misfit with the realities of our cultural, social uh, and uh, uh, economic um, lifestyles uh, within, you know, within the uh, uh, First Nations um, communities. So there was, uh, by our group having to first uh, have those discussions and be open and free enough to be in an environment that would able to be that would be able to look at uh, all of these past um, reports, inquiries, you know, royal commissions, um, all of the different uh, forms of activism, um, the different initiatives and uh, forums, such as we. Um, you know, we have with the Uluru Statement from the Heart, those groups, the Reconciliation Australia. We had a lot to actually uh, um, to be cognizant of, but be able to talk in a way where we realise that the it's the uh, it's the uh, majority of the Australian public who we needed to bring along with us. Um, you know, we we come to the table with our own experiences and our own ideas uh, about what we feel, uh, you know, our roles are. But in actual fact, if we didn't get to a point where we actually um, were able to just have an environment at our discussions that, that enabled us to speak freely and safely, uh, irrespective of our, our background, we needed to do that first because the burden of responsibility that each and every one of us came to that, those discussions, uh, you know, numerous discussions, uh, was very evident. But we had to create, uh, had to uh, really ha make sure that our narrative, uh, that level of respect was there. And I'm impressing upon this because I feel as though the depth of work that we undertook um, and, and, you know, the, uh, the Secretariat of the NIAA, my co-chair, I must mention Ray Griggs, everyone was on board, you know, everyone came to that table with that uh, responsibility because, it, uh, you know, to, in order to achieve the ability to be able to um, uh, to bring that messaging and and that design co-design uh, to our to our legislators, to our politicians, to our governments, local governments, importantly to our people, and this is why it's so important this stage we're at for the local and regional group consultations. So, so the work over the past year or so has been monumental, to say the least. Um, and bearing in mind too that where I come from, my cultural background informs me as my uh, elders and, and lawmakers, you do not speak for any other person. Mm -hmm. So so that's, yeah. you know, that pretty much has, has <clears throat> led that whole approach as yeah. well, where we are putting ourselves out there, encouraging everyone to have a say. So how do we do that? We can't do that without looking at our past and, and looking at what we're dealing with now, uh, in order to take this forward, so it's it's been, it's a it's a journey that we're still on. So mm -hmm. what I'm saying, in effect, is that uh, the the sum of the work that we've done thus far has taken into account uh, the importance and enabling us to be able to uh, 
not just navigate, but to include uh, a narrative and a process and a co-design that would uh, bring our people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, along the wider community and also our, um, our legislators. And I think that's so incredibly important, isn't it? Sitting there and, and having your voice and your experience and your knowledge, but also the knowledge of your elders and the guidance of elders and of community um, you're representing. And I think that's a really important thing is that we're sitting here and we're listening to three incredibly amazing people, but you're bringing so much wealth and guidance to this process as well as individuals and as members of your communities and your experiences. This really makes me think about, well, if this has been designed and it's been brought about to, to inform and to educate and, and to guide our processes, why not constitutional recognition? So why is this a separate process? And is that an important thing that's in separate process or are we not quite there yet? Or um, Dr. Emily, I'd really love to hear your thoughts on this for both the preamble or changes to accommodate Indigenous voice. What, what are your thoughts when, when have that have been going through your head during this process in terms mm -hmm. of constitutional recognition? Um, thanks, Dr. Sadie. Uh, I help bring in constitutional recognition in Tasmania. So each state has its own constitution. And in 2016, this was less than 23 months from raising the idea that perhaps Aboriginal Tasmanian people could be acknowledged in a preamble to having our dear and precious governor, um, Her Excellency, Professor Kate Warner, sign the royal assent for that. Now, when constitutional recognition happened, Oh, it was just the most amazing, incredible moment in my life because as Aboriginal Tasmanians, we went from we went from extinction into humanity. <laughs> and so part of the issue was that the the stress and the pressure of having to fight for the right to actually exist and be recognized as Aboriginal, that creativity filled that gap. I've never felt more free. But here's the thing. Um, I'm still reliant on my personal contacts to engage with ministers or heads of agency. So while I feel like we've got this big window here I'm looking on Aboriginal history, it's actually the glass means that you can't hear me speak. So you can acknowledge and recognise me as part of constitutional recognition, but you can't hear me in a public, legitimate, formal process. And so for me, yes, constitutional recognition is really important, but I believe the relationship is more important than the paperwork because to get something in our constitution is of such magnitude and effort that if we get that wording wrong, this is going to be disaster for us. And as our relationship proceeds, of course, we've got to have that twist. We've got to have the little twist. We've got to uh, progress on that basis. So I don't, uh, for me, this is going to become a natural progression, uh, constitutional recognition, but first we have to have the relationship before we formalise the paperwork, right? And so I feel quite confident that this is a good staged approach. It's not the end of the story. It's just demonstrating how we get there. Thank you so much, um, Dr Lee. And, and, and Mr Kennett, I, I might actually redirect that question to yourself as well because I know that... Um, when we're starting policy, when we're starting processes, we've got a one vision um, and there's lots of time and negotiation and it, it's something that actually comes out, it might, might not come out how we've, as, as uh, Dr Lee said, it might not come out with the exact words that we may have envisioned um, before, it may be something that has to be a compromise. How do you see this process and, and how do you see um, Indigenous voice and constitutional recognition uh, moving forward? Thank you. I agree with Emma's sentiment 
the great difference between the two is constitutional recognition will require a referendum. Mm. And in order, I don't want to see a referendum if it is put up lost, right? And the record of referendums is not good. Mm. So I think we have to do a lot more in terms of educating along the way. And the voice is part of that education. And the voice can be established without a referendum. It's a decision by the parliament. That's why I think, Sadie, that video is so important. So there are some people now who are misrepresenting what the voice is about. And if I was in a position of authority, which I'm not, I would be using that video in every theatre, in every social media, just continually repeating it because it removes the ability of those who are opposed to giving the Indigenous community a voice. It removes from them the opportunity to misrepresent what the voice is about. So to me, the voice is an opportunity to establish something that is meaningful soon, to have it be recognised as a responsible body doing good work, rather than moving straight to the concept of a constitutional change through referendum, which I fear right now would not succeed. So to me, it's about step by step by step. And I think the voice is a very important part in the process. I don't know where it's all going to finish. And I don't think in one sense, how do I say it without offending anyone? It's actually what we do that is, and how we respect and treat each other, which is a lot more important than any piece of paper, right? The voice would be to me a wonderful achievement in the short term. What follows after that will in part depend on how the voice members perform and the influence they have and the way in which they are then listened to and received by the politicians. That actually, this is a, a question I'm going to direct as well to Dr. Odegaard, because I do think it's important we, we, we reflect on this. And I think that that's really something that plays in my mind a lot as an Aboriginal person is that we do need to learn and we are on a journey. Um, and if we go to a referendum, the majority of Australia, you know, a majority of a majority um, needs to vote yes, but that's not necessarily Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. So the decision is not necessarily ours in that particular, in that particular um, direction. And, and just from walking around community and having conversations, I know that there are a number of different thought processes on not only Indigenous voice, but constitutional recognition. And I'd really love, um, Dr. Odegaard, just to hear your reflections as well about how voice works. And as Mr. Kennett said, I think that video is incredibly important for, for breaking down misinform misinformation, but how you see this process working and also how you see constitutional recognition maybe in the future. Yeah, thank, thanks, Sadie. And uh, look, I, I uh, concur with both uh, uh, Dr. Emily and also uh, Jeff uh, Kennett on this, but I just want to add a bit more, you know, a little bit of a different um, <clears throat> experience on this as well. Um, I, I always believed, you know, we, we, uh, we need constitutional recognition. Uh, many years ago, I wrote a, a, a master's on law and Aboriginal land claims in Australia, and I spoke about that. And, I, and later, I, I wrote a PhD on treaty where, you know, I spoke about that as well. But, you know, you know, there's three parts to it. It's what we want uh, as First Nations, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander people. It's what the law provides and the reality, right? Now, the reality is that we... We can't go to a referendum if it, you know, if it's obvious that it's going to fail. We need the majority support. We are the minority, so we need that majority support. So in all that work that I did, and probably over 20 years, and, 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 and not only that, you know, I, I, uh, 
I was an advocate. I am an advocate for treaty as well. But it's more the learnings around that and it's always the reality that kept coming back to me. So, so it, it, I, th I had these aspirations, but the reality is, as, as Jeff pointed out, we cannot go to something, uh, go to a referendum, if it's in all likelihood of failing. Now, this whole process of the voice, what we've undertaken, we have paid the utmost respect to all those various campaigns that are happening out there, um, you know, that are pushing hard for constitutional recognition. We're not, we're not, we're not against that, but what we're saying is that we we have to have a process. We have to, uh, you know, and and bear in mind that we we have a visionary. We have a minister, our first minister for Indigenous uh, Australians, who's Indigenous, and 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 is visionary in the sense. And I'm I'm saying this because uh, we've undertaken a process that is unprecedented. Okay, this whole local and regional consultations process is unprecedented. So we we are we are asking our people, but also bringing the broader uh, Australian community in as part of these consultations. Now, um, there's a lot of goodwill and good sentiment out there, and that was demonstrated with the reconciliation walk across the bridge. I mean, this, you know. But, but, uh, but what we need to do, we need to get to the strongest position, put us in the strongest position. So part of that journey, what we're going through now and what we will be going through for, for a while to, to, to come is to get us to the strongest possible position where we have standing um, right across uh, our Australian nation that when we go to a referendum for constitutional recognition that we will have that. Um, at this point, you know, we, we, we're, in the, we're in the process, but we have had to uh, design, we've had to um, uh, design a process, a vehicle that will take us to that point. So uh, yes, uh, the short, short answer is that's what I want. That's what many of us want, but we're not going to achieve it if we just, if we just go outright and say this is what we want this is what we want now and you know we've waited long enough we have to go through a process and it's like many of our elders have said and my father uh, he was you know he would be nearly 100 today spoke five languages and I say this with all due respect to say well this came to me from a place of a cultural authority was to say you cannot be confrontational you have to bring everyone along I didn't know what it meant then, many years ago. I have some idea now. So we have to be in a position where we're bringing each other along and it is an educational process. So uh, yes, down, you know, a bit further along when we've had everybody's voices on, we need to hear from our people, from all Australians about this whole, um, you know, uh, what, and they will tell us, uh, why constitutional recognition is important. This is all part of this, this a very open and transparent uh, process of consultations. Yes. Sadie, yes. I wonder, can I just make a comment, please? Please. And I'm watching some of the questions that are coming in and comments being made by our viewers. This is what so often happens within the community. When we're talking about, in this case, trying to establish the voice, we leap into constitutional recognition, and then we start to muddy the water. And as you know, not everyone in the Indigenous community agrees with the establishment of the voice. So we've got a big educational job to do, uh, but it's simpler to establish it than it is constitutional recognition. And as Donna said and Emma said, I think if we can get the voice up, if we can convince the politicians to establish it and the community to accept it, we're in a much better position to recognise the fundamental values of our First Peoples, what they are, what they represent, where they've come from, different cultures. I just don't like the way every conversation on any other issue 
that is meant to advance the indigenous cause gets, if I can put it, gets immediately transferred to constitutional recognition because we lose the importance mm -hmm. of the task we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And, and I, look, I, I actually really, really appreciate that comment because I think it is a very, very good point is we need to look at things um, individually. It's a scaffolded approach and we need to be respectful of each different um, each different initiative that we're taking. And this is one particular initiative. And by um, changing the conversation or merging the conversation with something else, we're losing the meaning and the power of what this particular initiative is. I um, live my life through something called Nimara, which is Radri, and it means polite, honour, respect and do slowly. Things take time. We need to respect them. We need to respect each other. And we actually need to follow that process. And I think that's an incredibly important point. The other point was that we do have a number of questions and I have taken up a lot of the panel's time with my own questions and that would be very remiss of me if I don't pay attention to our wonderful audience. Um, so I have a few here and please excuse me if I don't reach everybody's questions. All of them are absolutely amazing and very, very important and we will reach out to you afterwards and then we'll make sure that they are answered. Um, but I have a few on the co-design process and so there's one from Ada and Sarah that saying how do we ensure organizations create culturally safe spaces that allow true co-design will there be training um, how can co-design be delivered in a way that doesn't enrich existing inequities and power differences between parties involved so I guess they're looking at it of a more of a an approach nationally and bringing it in um, to all different levels so our panel, anybody who'd like to take that particular question? Well, um, I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to just say, well, this, that pretty much uh, was how we, uh, how we approached it. And that was to, um, to look at, um, okay, to not compromise anything uh, uh, in the co-design that, uh, you know, uh, against anything that did work. In other words, uh, some of that, that modelling that suits uh, the various uh, community groups or communities, uh, any of those decision-making uh, uh, structures, frameworks uh, that work. Well, we we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't ex we wouldn't expect to to change any of that. And um, mm. uh, and. Yeah, jump in any time, uh, Emma or, uh, or uh, you know, Jeff on this. But uh, this is why we, in the in the co-design, uh, we we considered that we looked very deeply at uh, existing structures at work, um, and bearing in mind that there there would have been dozens more that wouldn't have come to our attention, but but the the whole intention was to you know, don't change anything if it works, because uh, you know mm. that would that be counter to what you know to what the voice and uh, and, the, and the design of it uh, is. Yes. 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 Yeah, that autonomy in our communities to self determine how they want their advice to be given and heard. You know, and to to it's not taking away from any community. This process is about amplifying and, and um, just sending it upwards and outwards. The good news that is happening on the ground in communities, and I think that's, you know, one of the joys <laughs> about the National Co-Design. Proactive is, you know, one of our catchphrases, one of our key embedded terms for what we're meant to be doing. Why wouldn't you want to bring all this good news about what's happening on local and regional levels up to the national? I, I can't wait for this to come through because people are going to see Indigenous people. You know, we're not, we're not the problem. We're, we're, we're solutions, you know. We just need to have that arena, that formal arena of government and parliament to be able to act out so many good things that are happening in our communities. Uh, uh, Sadie, so I see it as being bringing culture, right? Bringing the Indigenous culture to mm -hmm. the fore. 
and then mm -hmm. using that collectively to educate. I mean, we are one person on two lands. And those who legislate are in the main non-Indigenous. We are getting more Indigenous people into the parliament, and that's excellent. But they're still very much and always probably will be the minority. So the voice is the culture. It is the heart. And if it can, and if people need training, as was suggested in the quit, they will get that training. But it won't be about training in their culture. It'll be a training as how to best present their culture to the parliament and to receive stuff back from it. So it's a focal point for the things that those of us who are not Indigenous don't fully or at all understand. I think too, um, you know, just speaking to 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 Jeff's uh, to Jeff there that um, this is an opportunity. I mean, we we have been calling for decades to you know for governments and legislators to listen to us. We know what's best for us. You know, we are our own cultural authorities in in whatever uh, capacity. Uh, but we need to uh, be the advisors and informers uh, of what, whatever policies and legislation is made that, uh, that is better suited to us, not, not uh, just, you know, uh, uh, imposed upon us. This is where there's been this conflict and, and where things have failed. We, we, we're addressing the failure. And we're asking people to to have their have their say in how we can fix this. That's essentially that's it. And in doing so, this is what's giving this as as Emma uh, and and Jeff has talked about. This is what's giving us um, uh, bringing First Nations culture, people, uh, practices, uh, governance structures, not not according. To, to the dominant law, but how we go about our things our way uh, and how it works. And, and where, there, where there are those um, misfits, you know, the gaps in, in policy making, where that advice uh, is sorely needed uh, is, is what we're aiming to achieve so that, um, so that there is a better, not just understanding, but as as Emma said, self-determination plays a massive part in this. So, you know, and, and, and through that, you know, you have this wonderful educational process that brings all Australians on board to say, well, to see how diverse we are as, as First Nations peoples, how, how complex, how vibrant. Uh, the, it's, it's going to, and this is the exciting thing that I'm really looking forward to, it's going to bring so much richness uh, to the discussions, to this whole partnership uh, bringing, uh, bringing us all together uh, as, as a nation. I think, it's, I think we have got to have that opportunity to complete the task of what we're doing um, and, and in such a way that is respectful. Be respectful of what, what you know, of what all these uh, good people uh, and those who we're consulting with uh, are endeavouring to do. I think that's really interesting. There's a, there's a particular question that I think really speaks to that as well, because I think it grows to our understanding. So um, of what it, the policy does and why it's important. So um, Danielle asks, I'm interested in how policy or issues relevant to First Nations people is defined where the voice is engaged. Wouldn't it be true that most policy is relevant to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? All decisions are made on country and that Aboriginal and that is Aboriginal land. Where do you therefore not expect to be consulted in the ways you've been described? And I think that's really interesting because if we're talking about how, well, everything already encompasses this anyway, but <laughs> at the same time, you know, and, and, and so it's, well, what is this process doing? Well, I mean, I have lots of thoughts, but I'm not on the panel. Um, but <laughs> Emma, Emma, you have your, your signalling you'd like to be the first person to, to answer that one. Um, I, I really love this because, you know, one of the quiet facts about Indigenous voice to parliament is that it's not just 
uh, parliament and government asking for our advice, it's a two-way street where we get to ask government and parliament for advice from their ministers, from their bodies. So I, you know, for, for me, this this is the this is the beautiful reciprocity of Indigenous voice that there's nothing wrong in going to uh, uh, gosh, Treasury you know, or Sports Minister and saying, can you help us? Because when they when we are asking for help in defining our advice. Those other Australians are also learning too. And so they're going to wake up and they're going to go, oh, that policy should have had all the mob in it, right? Or maybe we should just do this. And so it is that, that beautiful sense of being able to draw people into the advice with us as opposed to just being this static thing and saying, well, you know, well, government, we're only going to ask you advice on health and employment and training, that's it. And so that's that's the beautiful thing. It's not, not just advice for our issues, but the solutions that we can see for broader communities. Why shouldn't Indigenous peoples be leaders in regions of their own country, right? and particularly in remote areas? Uh, uh, so I just sort of see this, you know, the, this thing about where the policy sits and putting things into little boxes. I'm not terribly worried about that because this is, again, why I don't want to see it in the Constitution at the moment. The relationship is going to change. It's going to grow. Those roots are going to get stronger, you know. My grandfather always said to build good skyscrapers, you've got to have, you know, um, underground, you know, supports. They've got to be deep. And so this is what we're doing. <laughs> And uh, if I could just add to that as well, uh, having addressed um, quite a large group of policymakers, uh, federal government policymakers, and um, asked to speak on the importance of uh, including Indigenous people in policymaking, and that's right across uh, a whole number of uh, portfolios. And I, you know, when I looked out, Amongst the sea of policy makers, I thought, oh my goodness, you know, who am I to tell people how to change policy, you know, and and there was there was quite a bit of uh, resistance, would I say, uh, dare I say, um, to the idea um, of actually looking at every single piece of policy uh, uh, legislation and saying, well, you, you should be considering uh, in including Indigenous perspectives. Oopsie daisies. We seem to have a little bit of a technical oh. issue. <laughs> so it, it, was, it, it was quite challenging. Some of those brilliant policymakers have been writing and drafting policy for a very long time. So to have all of us, you know, after this couple of days, um, those, um, you know, very highly articulate and intelligent people on board. And, it, 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 you know, we were having, we were having wonderful uh, discussions by the end of it, saying, well, if we're looking at, um, you know, I'll just throw this out there, you know, no, I won't, um, a, a particular area, and, and I, I tried to explain it without being too simplistic. Cast an Indigenous lens over that. If you're looking at geoscience or something, you know, there are, you know, there is the scientific and then there's, there's that uh, beautiful cultural, social and, uh, you know, part of that that gives you a different, whole different lens. And then you can actually see, uh, you know, this was the first time we'd had discussions with policy makers and they could actually see and were 200% on board to, uh, you know, who are warm to that idea. And that's what we need to do. Not to say, well, you're doing the wrong thing or anything like that. It's just to say there's another element that is missing and that is our value, uh, our sacred sites and places, uh, our customs, our, you know, our transient population. So that's why there's various changes. So a whole heap of things. But 
but the important thing about, about that is we need to, we, you know, policy making is so important because not just in that, that landscape, but also the, the humanity, the human side of it. You know, we are people, we come from places. Mm. We have a unique history and culture and traditions and that's very that's as relevant today, albeit it's it's changed because we are static, you know, uh, in who we are and our identity, uh, and 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 so this is why I see, you know, we can enrich policy making for, for all of us. So, I have, um, no, no, no. Have you seen? those discussions those discussions because i've got i've got a question here by um jem carey that talks about has the panel engaged with the administrative and evidence uh, government administrative and government evidence just thinking about what we learned through the mog of indigenous affairs the joint up gov the joined up governance evidence evidence based on having problems with these words of what works and what doesn't were, uh, were you where you in intervene in a government as a system and culture of its own there we go i got to the end of the question but um so apologies for that everybody um but i think that that's a really important thing because if you've been having discussions and you're part you know appointed by government you're having discussions um about this are you finding that there has been this conversation now being had about what's purpose, pro, proper policy and what's process and are you finding that this is something that is then moving forward in that space even at this time when you're still design you know when it's still actually um coming to fruition the vision that is being yeah. had mm -hmm. Well, this, uh, if I could just say that this is a work in pro progress um, and we're going, you know, as we know, uh, through to uh, stage two of the co-design process. But, um, but, but I do see a, um, I do see, if I can uh, put it this way, a warming to, uh, yes. you know, to change. So I think, I think that in itself, uh, uh, is is promising, and this is really what we we need to do. You know, I mean, you can you can look at um, any number of reports and recommendations and things like that, but we really need to we really need to get to the practical, pragmatic, you know, reality stuff, and and we can only do that by you know by having these discussions, these webinars, this educational process that we're talking about. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Odegaard. And, and I think that that's so true. It is a process that's taking time and we are actually, some, some of these questions might become, might seem slightly premature, but I actually think that that's part of the process, isn't it? Because we're reflecting on some of those endpoints and how, how do they come about and, and are they achievable or how do we work with them in our current, um, in our current lens and government structure that we have. And there was a question I saw earlier um, that I found quite interesting and I will preface it by saying that I am very much aware um, of what Mr. Kennett was saying about let's not muddy the waters. So I might um, expand yeah. it a little bit more if I may and not just talk about constitutional yeah. recognition, but all of the processes we're currently going through. Um, how do we see these particular kinds of processes that might be fitting in more with our government um, or fitting in more with what works now? Um, how do we see them in terms of treaty processes and in terms of other um, processes that maybe um, other sections of the community may go on tour or might be further down the track than we would ideally prefer at this point in time. Do we see them being instead of or do we see them working with? Um, I know we were talking before, I'm, I'm now taking up all the time, I know we were talking before about the fact that it is a scaffolded approach, it's a learning approach, it's something that we're moving slowly through. Um, but I really would love to address that question because I do think it was an important one that was asked. Mm -hmm. Uh, you want me to farm, Donna? 
Yes, far away. All right. Sadie, you're taking us back into dangerous space. Yes, indeed. Suffice, su suffice to say, in Victoria, they are or have established a body which is working well. Canberra has a different model, which is working very well. This is a different process. Mm -hmm. And we allow the states and we'll allow the Commonwealth to do what they think is right on the issues that you're trying to take us to. We will draw on the experiences and have drawn on the experiences. And even in the video, it indicated that where bodies did exist in other territories, we might draw the representatives from those. This model has not yet been fully defined. So we are looking for best practice and we don't want duplication. So therefore, again, I can only say to you, uh, please, this, from my point of view, is a process for the voice. Other states and territories are going through a process. Others in the community are going through a different process towards a different form of recognition. Our job, Donna's leadership, Emma's involvement, mine, is all about working to the commission that the minister has given us to try and establish a voice that is representative that will work well, which will help ease the Australian community to recognise the value of our First Peoples. And someone put up on my screen a few moments ago, why do we focus on the negatives rather than the positives, which goes back to a comment I made before. There are increasingly thousands of Indigenous men and women in a whole range of fields that have made a choice to pursue a career. We don't hear from them on a regular basis compared to the suicide of a 12 year old in Western Australia or the prison rates or the recidivation rates. We actually need to draw together the educators, those who, so that we end up with a community of first people who elect and decide on choice. Many want to stay on land, at home. Others want to be commentators, members of parliament, sportsmen and women, teachers, doctors, lawyers. There's not a conflict. Yes. Increasingly, they are all respecting country. Now, we've got to get that message right. And I think the voice is a way to do that. And I hope it's a way to do it. So. What are we on about? You very cleverly tried to take us into treaty and to constitutional recognition. I reject that at the moment. I, I desperately want the I desperately want the voice to get up. I want it to be respected. Yes. I want it to be heard. And importantly, I want to make sure that the community as a whole embraces it for what it represents. And it comes down to one word: culture culture that the Indigenous communities have that those who have arrived since do not have the same attachment mm -hmm. to land and country. And, and I'll just add to that, Jeff, throughout this whole process, um, and, and, and it's not about the, um, you know, the government's agenda or anything like that, but throughout this whole process, we have taken a very inclusive approach right at the outset. Mm. We are not there to compromise any other groups uh, who, who are moving in a certain direction, but we are there to say, well, the voice uh, is, as I said earlier, it's unprecedented. We, we set out to reach the hardest to reach is hardest to reach communities, individuals, cultural authorities. This is not constrained to, you know, a treaty debate or, or a statement debate or, a, a, you know, groups debate. This is about reaching as far widespread as we possibly can. It's, it's, I keep saying it's unprecedented. It is. So it's about inclusivity and not being exclusive on, you know, on our, on our, uh, what we've been directed with. So we've, and, and very pragmatic 
uh, in approach. Uh, this is what we have been uh, charged to do, and this is what we are doing. Uh, but in no way does it um, cross that line. We have a specific uh, task uh, at hand, and, and we need to be respectful of all other uh, movements that are happening. Um, my goodness, uh, you know, there are elements uh, of, of, of those uh, debates and initiatives that, that touch all of us. But this is the first time we have the opportunity to include everyone. And as I say, you know, we, we have uh, some of our cultural authorities, uh, well, uh, particularly on our group, um, uh, who, uh, who are leaders who are doing extraordinary things. You never hear about them. Um, but, uh, you know, the, we need to have those voices. English is in the first language, mm -hmm. maybe second, third, fourth, fifth. Um, they exist. We don't want it to be con constrained to a particular narrative, let alone a, a, a particular agenda. This is very broad. This is wide sweeping. And this is why we, we maintain the importance of the voice. And it, we are also cognizant of the fact this will supersede uh, governments. You know, we, this needs to be uh, an ongoing um, uh, voice that it doesn't matter which side of politics you're on because the, we, we need to get to, to, we need to have our journey, have the uh, legitimacy and ability and legitimacy to see this through. Otherwise, there are going to be many voices who are going to, who are going to miss out uh, for the sake of a particular agenda. Mm -hmm. Amy, someone, sorry, try to butt in. Someone's just put up on the screen, we want restitution, not constitution, right? Uh, is it, don't we want universal recognition and respect of culture? Isn't that what we're trying to achieve through everything we do? Rather than bring it down to, we'll lose people if we talk restitution, constitution. We want universal recognition of the culture. Because if you understand the culture, you'll understand the differences. If you don't understand the culture, there will continue to be misunderstandings. So whoever wrote restitution, not constitution, I salute you. Uh, but I'd like to put a different view forward. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it just needs to be a nuanced view. Um, dear Honour, Jeff Kennett, really a nuanced view about this. All right, so, sorry, Sadie, I just, there's a really interesting question there from Jay. Hello, Jay, <laughs> about the slippery slope and the facilitating even seemingly small proposed initiatives. Oh, I completely get that. Because once you let Indigenous peoples in the room, then they're just going to be asking for everything, aren't they? <laughs> oh, now what do they want, right? Um, it's quite interesting because, you know, if you're an Indigenous person, and I've just had recently had this argument in research, we do everything. We don't actually ask for much. <laughs> I mean, you know, in Tasmania, we ask to be recognised as human that much really, you know, to get a constitutional recognition. Uh, I've, I've had a bit of a problem with funding because they expected the prosciutto, except I gave them the Devon budget. <laughs> so we don't, you know, I mean, at the moment, we're sort of asking for twice as much because, you know, who's going to stop us? We can ask anything because there's no process here. And and so what I'd like is, you know, for this process to be actual, to show, oh, God, they're not actually asking for much, are they? You know, they just want to include it in the policies. And so I completely understand the panic. It's, oh, fear of black planet. Um, and in the end, it's, that's not, it's just not going to happen. But, you know, uh, are people just so frightened about this? Um all I can just say is that you just got to look him in the eye and say, honestly, 
I don't think there's anything to fear here, really. We're already doing this, you know, in certain different forms. We just need to formalise it. This is a, for me, this is necessarily a badge and brand tweaking. You know, I'm making it a formal process of parliament because we're engaged, we're interested, we're already here, we're doing it. You know? Might as well just open up the door rather than us, you know, throwing stones at your window to get attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. An open dialogue, a dialogue where everybody can actually sit down. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and, and I think, sorry, um, Sadie, you know, and I think this this whole process, I mean, it's very transparent, you know, um, and 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 that's the thing that um, uh, that we, you know, we've had troubles, we've had challenges with in the past where, you know, we've had uh, certain agendas imposed upon us and it's like, well, when did this happen and why wasn't I asked? I mean, th this is so transparent. We're, we're casting the net out to say, have your say. You have an opportunity to have your say. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, people of culture, of language, of tradition, and those who, you know, who aren't quite there, but, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, where, my, where am I in this uh, whole identity thing? Well, it's like Jeff says, you know, there is a culture, there is a, there's value of our First Nations people, right, and, and we're having a very transparent uh, conversation, if you will, uh, an invitation to say, you know, let's talk about this, uh, tell us what you think. Uh, is this important to you? What is important to you? A whole range. You know, there is no restriction on the questions or the answers that, that you're looking for. Not saying that we can provide all the answers, but we we need to have that discussion. We need to start talking to each other. It's never happened. So, uh, you know, and I encourage everyone who's put up questions there. I can't really see them on my screen, but um, here's an opportunity to put in a submission, you know, fill out a survey, yes. send in, you know, whatever you want, you know, providing this, you know. Um, Donna, can you just swivel so we can see the website behind yes. you on the poster? There we go. Voice. It's, it's easy. <laughs> Voice.niaa.gov.au. Easy. Fantastic. And I, and I even think the suggestion there in the in the questions about creating a network of what was it, social policy and Indigenous researchers for shared learning and advocacy, that bringing together more people and that learning process is in all different forms, I think is incredibly, incredibly important. But um, so to end, I really love, and I know that we've probably, you've probably um, stated this multiple times, but why not again? Um, I really love to hear what each of you, at the end of the day, in the ideal world, what would you love to see from this process? Uh, shall I start? Yeah. Your please, please. <laughs> I would really dearly love to have a better um, understanding uh, and value in the first place for our First Nations peoples, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, our culture, you know, our aspirations, understanding of where we've come from and where we want to go, whatever that means. Um, I would really love to see more Indigenous people uh, involved in our governments, our, our local, regional, state, territory, federal, but have all of that value preserved and protected for all times. You know, I don't particularly, I don't particularly um, say that, um, you know, just demanding a treaty, which is what, what my work has been about, 
are demanding constitutional recognition and all of that, but let's actually get the relationship right. If you, you look at everything, you know, there has been, uh, you know, the, 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 the problem has been our relationship with each other, um, the wider community, uh, our, our governments, historically, it's, it's building that relationship. Mm. And, you know, call it what you will, but I think it's achievable to improve that. And, and if we can get to that stage where we are aligned with our thinking, we don't, don't have to be perfectly aligned, but we are aligned in, in the important values around who our First Nations peoples are, and, and, you know, this is our country, you know, 100%. Um, and we need to have that recognition, uh, but we also need to be in a position of self-determination, you know, uh, going forward for the future and bring everyone along. Oh, definitely. Uh, Mr. Kennett? Oh. Ah, you're on oh. mute. <laughs> that, that was probably my best comment. Uh, I would like to see the voice established to do good work because otherwise I fear a lot of people have wasted a lot of their time. For, for me, I'm just so proud to honour every other person who has contributed in this pathway from all the statement from 67 you know from everyone and, and to be able to you know I'm sitting here with you know the Donna and the honor and I, I just want the right to be fabulous without having to justify myself first you know <laughs> I think we'll leave it on that won't we <laughs> why not why yeah. not <laughs> Well, I want to thank all three of you so much. I think we are standing in the footsteps of giants. And if we can just see two or three, we can just be a little bit further ahead than when we started for our younger ones and for those coming along behind us. I think it's incredibly important that we are all here learning from this process and learning from you all. Just I know that I've taken so much out of this conversation and I'm sure all of the audience has. So I want to thank our panel members so incredibly much for taking the time to talk to us today. And I also really want to thank our audience, particularly the person who got me in trouble with Jeff Kennett. <laughs> thank you for that question. <laughs> um, <but> Can I? <laughs> But, but um, thank you all so much. It was an incredibly, incredibly value, valuable conversation. And please join Impact 2021 for the next uh, part two of this seminar series. I think it's very much worth tuning in and learning more. Thank you all so much. Have an absolutely wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much, Sadie. Dr. Thank Sadie. Thank you, Sadie. You didn't get into trouble. <laughs> Well, it's something else to be told off by the honour, isn't it? A little badge there. <laughs> <laughs> he does, See you later. He does. Have, a, have a good day, everyone. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs>